It's about melanin color me in motion or something like that, you know? Malachi Andrews from California. I'm not sure where he was from. Um, but but you've had your uh, you know, your boys, Le Grand Clay, Renoko Rashid, all on the West Coast. So uh with you. Any comments, questions, anything that you have to ask? Oh you need to come on. Yeah, I need to come I know you have something. I have a question about the, um, how you increase your melon in the brain in terms of activating and connecting to the universe. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there are, there are some books that are really good. Uh, Brother uh, Edward Bruce Bynum wrote a book called Dark Light. Uh, that's a very good book. Uh, of course, uh, if if you, I, I have cards, email me and I will send you back my book list on melanin. Also, study guides will be given out. I also have a catalog, a DVD catalog. I've also brought uh, DVDs with me as it relates to neural melanin and uh, the importance of understanding it. It's, um, it's, it's mental, physical, spiritual, and soulful. Oh, Melanin okay. is a cosmic reality. It's the mothership. That's what Malachi Andrews called it. He, he called it the mothership. It's the, it, it, it is what, if, if you were searching for the creator, Melanin is the creator. Whether it's in the cosmos or whether it's on our earth or whether it is within us. It is, it, everything comes out of the darkness. And, and what you eat is very important. And I'm so glad that brother is here. Chano? Kano. Is here from the uh, farm. Uh, you all should be. I, I, I just joined his email the other day, uh, his newsletter. Uh, he's a very important part of this. All this information is wonderful. But if you don't have a healthy body, this information will die with your illness. <laughs> you see, so we have to directly support this brother and his family and that farm and make sure that nobody touches it, nobody messes with it, and that he can prosper. He can prosper. Because it's about money. No matter how you look at this, I know a lot of folk think that the money is, is, is the root of all evil, but it, 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 it is also the source of our redemption, emancipation, and liberation. <laughs> it's not, money is not the problem, it's how you use it. That's the problem. In fact, everything in life, it's not about what it is, it's how you use it. That computer, I was talking to Brother Knuth. That computer, man, I, I come from a, um, a cut and paste generation. I'm a typewriter generation kind of guy. Okay, when I say cut and paste, I meant glue and scissors. Okay, that's where I'm coming from. This is a phenomenal. For me to be able to sit here and as we move through this, I got a whole bunch to learn. Get a little bit better as time goes on. But this is a phenomenal machine. But this also, you know, when I was growing up, my mama used to say, you know, don't talk to strangers in the street. Now we gotta tell our children, be careful who you talk to in your room. Because you got strangers in your house, coming in your house every day. And so it's a whole nother type of world. So it's not what it is, it's how you use it. You know, and the vendors that are out here, we need to take 10% of our salary and we need to spend it with the vendors. We need to get a budget. This is a homework, I'm a teacher, I gotta get Get a monthly budget and you just, and you calculate what 10% of your budget is. And you find the vendors that are vending this, the books, the clothing, whatever it is, you find, and out of your 10%, you spend 10% with your vendors. These are our small black businesses. When everyone's talking about businesses, these are our small black businesses. When we break, we're gonna have a break this morning. We'll do about an hour and a half. Then we're gonna have a break. That, that break is carefully structured so that you have time with vendors. Because so many times we go to events and we speak, 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 and then we go. Or we speak, 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 have lunch. We pass the vendors. Okay, but we need orchestrated, structured time where you can engage with them and, and talk with them. And, and even if you may not have the capital today, 
you have the capital in the future, 10% of our salary should go to building up our black businesses. And where do you start? What you got in your hand. Start right outside of it. Whether it be the oils, or whether it be whatever else, they may be vending. You, you, you consciously spend 10% of your salary with the vendors to build them up. Because if they go out, we go out. And it's important that we start looking at that. That's something that we really should look at and, and, and understand. But the food, going back to your question, my sister. What brother has right here, that's like one third of the challenge. What we put in our body. Man, that salad was good. <laughs> you know, we had a little get together last like night. I was in Jen, that sister's gingerbread. You need to bottle that and sell that. But I mean, these are the kind of brother. Question. Can you explain to me um, the, the symbol on your shirt? With the okay. This is, this is, as a personal individual, I've been trying to teach Metternet. I'm going to tell you something about oils that I sell. I only sell one oil. I'm, I'm going to tell you a story about the oils down the road. Uh, but the, um, Medunetta, um, the writings of our people, Medunetta must become our classical African language. Just like the Western world uses Greek. Now, by the way, Greek doesn't exist. There, there is no Greek language. Basically what you're looking at is, you're looking at the Rosetta Stone, okay, the Rosetta Stone, okay. The Rosetta Stone has three languages written on it. This is what they said cracked the code of hieroglyphs or Medunet. The top one is written in hieroglyphs, so-called Medunet. The middle one is in Heratic, which is the everyday script language of the comedic African peoples. And the bottom one, they say, is classical Greek. And they said they were able to crack the code because people understood how to interpret classical Greek. No, Napoleon the, uh, brought a hundred and something brilliant scholars of Europe to, to Egypt in uh, 1798. And they studied Egypt. And and, you know, if I could just put a side note on this, just, I'm going to stick a pin for me. Because there's a story that hasn't been told. There was a brother that was born in IT. His mother's name was Marie Dumas. His father was a count in France, and he moved to Haiti and lived there. He fell in love with Marie Dumas, married her, and had a son. And... Marie Dumas would pass away, and this young man, the son, would be moved with his father back to France. And his name was uh, Thomas Alexander Dumas, okay. Haitian mother, French father. His father would marry again, and he was so incensed that his father married again, forgetting the memory of his mother, black woman that he had, he decided to have nothing to do with his family anymore. So he goes into the military and he rises to the rank of general, probably one of the most powerful military warriors that France has ever known, if not Europe. Now at the same time, he has an elder brother that is also from Martinique, who is the greatest swordsman in France in particular and in Europe in general. His name is Chevalier Saint George. Chevalier St. George is not only the number one fencer, he is the greatest violinist in Europe. He's a little bit older than Thomas Dumas. Thomas Dumas becomes the greatest fencer in Europe, along with being a military general. He's caught up in the intrigue of Napoleon and uh, Marie Antoinette and the French Revolution, but he also is sent by the military to go into Kemet in Egypt and open Egypt for France. Talk about a black man. Okay. Napoleon is going to follow him. I'm talking about Napoleon Bonaparte. He's going to follow him into Egypt. But this black man is going to open Kemet for the French to be able to come in. And this is where the scholars come with Napoleon to study Kemet. Okay. And one of them, by the way, is Constant, Constantine Volney, who is going to take a picture of what the Sphinx actually looked like. And the Sphinx is not the head of a man. It is not a body of a lion. It's the head of a woman 
and the body of a lioness. But that's a whole nother presentation. <laughs> it, it's much older than what we think. Word gets back that um, France is in need, because Napoleon is a general now, he's not emperor yet, that they want uh, somebody to come back. And so what happens is that um, they are going to decide who's going to come back, and it is decided that uh, Alexander, uh, 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 Thomas Alexander Dumas is going to return back first. The word was in the block that any, the first, if Napoleon or Thomas Dumas come back, the first person to come back is going to become Emperor of France. Yeah. That's the opening scene of the Three Musketeers. That was written that way to honor his father and the legend that his father had. This is Alexandre Dumas writing about his father. Okay, this is our history. So I don't have any problem studying the classics. And when you study the Moors in Europe, it's time that we stop thinking that classical music is European music, because it's not. The piano was born in Africa, combining the instruments that we know as the harp. That's why the baby grand looks like a harp. You know the piano that you pull up and you put a stick there? If you look inside, that's a harp in there. The Africans brought that into Europe. And they combined it with the xylophone, which hits things, and then they combined it with the kalimba, which is the finger piano. And that's the piano that we know today. Here's another homework assignment. Take Thelonious Monk or Oscar Peterson, and then take Ludwig von Beethoven. Listen to them separately, and then combine the music and see how close both of those pianists sound, or the three of them sound. Oscar Peterson, I mean, you could take any of the piano players, really. But I'm focusing on Thelonious Monk, Oscar Peterson, and Ludwig von Beethoven. Listen to their music. They accused Beethoven of doing the same thing they accused uh, Thelonious Monk of doing in jazz. They said it's too sensual. Music brings out the feelings, not sexual, sensual. It brings out feelings in people. See, because the Western world don't know how to create feelings in their expressions. But when black folk get into it, they just got to get all, what to say, or get up all in it. <laughs> you know? It becomes it. Your hand motion becomes it. If you look at hip-hop, hip-hop is nothing but an extension. Hip-hop was born out of doo-wop. Doo-wop was born out of bebop. And bebop was born on the plantations. And the plantations music came directly out of Africa. This is our history. But let's get back to Medvedev. This is not classical Greek. This is a language that, this is another African script that the Greeks adapted. That became their written script. <coughs> Let's just talk about the comments that they were around us. Uh, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, all of the early thinkers, Thales of Miletus, all of the early thinkers were either poisoned, murdered, uh, or banished out of Greece for teaching a foreign doctrine. Mm -hmm. Now, follow the psychology behind this. Because it's all in front of us. It's all in front of us. It's just that if we don't put the connections in place, we're going to miss what it's really saying to us. So, if these thinkers, the so-called fathers of all this Greek thought, were banished or poisoned or murdered for teaching a foreign doctrine, it means that they must have brought someone else's information into Greece. Does that make sense to you? Aristotle is said to be the father of science. Okay? Stone legacy. He gives credit to his teacher Plato for being the one that educated him. But Plato is the father of philosophy. So how can someone, it's like going, get your PhD in philosophy, and then after you study philosophy, you get a PhD in science. There's something wrong with that. So where did all this, he stole the books of the ancient Chemites. And he just put his name on it. 
And, and that's what we're dealing with. There's no such thing as Greek people. They don't exist. That's why you don't have a Greece at a certain point. There is no such thing as a place called Greece. That area of the Mediterranean Basin is where all African people were living and the Eurasians that were coming down out of the northern tribe came down and consolidated themselves in the Mediterranean Basin and they superimposed themselves over the African people, the Kushites, that were in the islands of, of wherever the islands are, Sicily, uh, parts of Italy, parts of France. Africans were all in the Mediterranean Basin then. And they came down and they sat at the feet of these Africans and the best of them were told to go to Kemet or Egypt to study. Iamblichus writes of Pythagoras. He was the one that encouraged, if you really want to get hip, Pythagoras, you got to go to Egypt. The same thing with Thales of Miletus. Here's how you shut folk down in the Greek, uh, in the, in the Greek departments. Ask them a simple question. Who taught Thales of Miletus? Because he's their earliest thinker. He's like 600. BC. Who taught him? Who was his teacher? Let's go up to the Renaissance. Here's another question. Who taught Da Vinci? Where did he become a multiple genius? Where did it come from? Just tell me who his teacher is. But you see, they can't. Because if they if they did, they'd have to tell you Africans taught them. And they're not going to tell you that. We spend our lives talking about we the first this, we the first that to, to attain. We as African Americans in, in this area. But we don't know that it was the Moors that went into Europe and built up every university that exists there. And then some of them got smart, came to uh, the United States, uh, what was at the time the 13 colonies, situated themselves in a, a place um, that at that before that was called New Amsterdam. Uh, when England beat the Dutch, it became New York, and, and they built an uh, institution there. There were some people that came from Cambridge and Oxford, uh, from England to uh, the United States. And the Cambridge and Oxford was built by black people. It's built by black people. They came over and they, they built. And when I say built, I'm not saying that physical black people did it, but they sat at the feet of black people and together both Europeans and Africans built Cambridge and uh, but the idea came out of Africa. And that's what's important because I don't want to say anything that's outlandish because people can put me in check for that. And I want to be as accurate with us as possible. There were peoples of European descent who having sat at the feet of Africans had learned a great deal and became part of the administration of developing these institutions. But it was that they sat at the feet of black people to get there. But they still were there and they together came and they built a place that they honored after the king. So they called it King's College. Okay, in New York. And now all of us are just so proud to say, well I'm the first graduate from Columbia. But we don't know we built it. <laughs> We don't know our history. And I don't point fingers because the more I learn, the more I learn how much more there is to learn. I'm, I'm humbled at knowledge and wisdom because I don't have it all. And I'm still working real hard, real hard to get this information. And there's a lot that I don't know and there's a lot that I will know, but there's one thing that I do know. I know what I know. <laughs> and that's why I came to Sacramento, to share what I know with you. And uh, I hope that you will share uh, your knowledge with us, because we, we, we have a wonderful day planned. And I just, uh, well, I'll give it the to dancers, my sister. The dancers should be lining up in a minute. Okay. So you can probably. Yeah, but I, you know, I just want to thank my, my, my point of, of contact um, was uh, Bobby. And I just thank you, Bobby, for all that you did to make this this oh. happen. Oh, anything for you, brother? Oh no. <laughs> but, but I but I thank you know I you know I thank my sister Bobby for because I know what it takes. I've done this type of work in New York 16 years. I know what it takes to put something like this together. And it's a great deal of work. You know, and I appreciate people, not only that do it, but see a need for our community right. to have this type of information. And I thank the board of people around Bobby that made it happen. Because there are people, and, and if I could just ask you all to stand, the, the part of the board that, that made it happen, please stand. Please stand.
stand to be recognized because our community has to know you. You know, our community has to know you and appreciate you and recognize you for the work, you know, that you are doing consistently and constantly. Um, and so I just appreciate being here and I thank you uh, for taking this day, the, the most precious thing that we have in life is time. That's right. If you take somebody who is on their bed about to join the ancestors, deathbed, and you ask them, I'll give you one thing, and one thing only. And they're rich. Yeah. Rich. Got everything in the world. They won't ask for more money. They won't ask for more houses. They won't ask for more cars. They'll say, give me a little bit more time. That's right. So when you're at that point in your life that you have everything and someone asks you, they give you one thing, you must now know at that point that the most precious thing that we have is time. And so I appreciate all of you for taking this day out of your schedule uh, to be here and, and to do this work. We have serious work that we have ahead of us. If we are to do what we are planning to do. Please, my sister. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, because along the line with what you were talking about uh, with history, there's this little quote that I've been reading in this book that I thought I would share with you. This is Falsification of the African Amy Consciousness. Yes. Yeah. So it says, to manipulate history is to manipulate consciousness. To manipulate consciousness is to manipulate possibilities. And to manipulate possibilities is to manipulate power. Mm -hmm. So with what you're saying about all of that distortion of our past makes us weak. And therefore, we don't feel like we have the power to do what we're here to do Absolutely. in ourselves. So I thought it was a kind of relevant. A absolutely. And, you, and you, you know, my sister, to, to join that concept that our brother, Dr. Wilson, uh, we are a six-dimensional people living in a three-dimensional world. And by that I mean this. Western civilization is built on the physical senses. They're built on height, width, and depth. That's what they're built on. We are built on height, width, depth, but we have the fourth dimension, which is space-time. Because we have been for all, all time. Our, our DNA structure goes back a time that goes back into the cosmos. This is why I, I focus on cosmology. Because we limit ourselves when we think strictly as it relates to our time on this planet. We are My name is Alicia Lovely Beasley. I'm a minister at Will State Community Church. And I've come to for a libation to tell you how important it is for us to remember our ancestors. I even think about the strength that our ancestors have given us and the encouragement and just the inspiration that knowing their stories and keeping their names alive have given me in my lifetime of 36 years. I think about knowing my grandmother, but not knowing her well, but I know that I'm a part of her. She's a poet, I'm a poet. I've seen her twice in my life. Her blood runs through my veins. My grandfather was a reverend. I've seen him twice in my life. I'm now a minister. His blood runs through my veins. And it goes on, back, back to the beginning of time. We are connected, each and every one of us. And our ancestors are giving us strength, they're giving us power, they're giving us inspiration. So when we read their stories and we feel that connection to them, don't think it's something that someone has told you is negative. Think of it as positive and call their names frequently because they will come to your aid, they will come to your help. I've borne seven children in this lifetime. In each and every one of those times, I've called upon the ancestors, I tell you. <laughs> and they will come. The mothers come and sit by my bedside. And they, and they help me. They, they tell me to breathe. They tell me to relax. They tell me, we've done this before. You can do it, babe. <laughs> and we keep on going. And we keep on marching. And we keep on moving along. And we use their stories as inspiration for our lives to keep moving on. We use their stories as, as a way to take flight. 
while our feet are still on the ground. So we give thanks to them, and we invite them here today to be with us in this session, to come and, and sit next to us and minister to us as Brother Kaba is, is talking to us, as the drummers are drumming, as the dancers are dancing. We ask for them to come and be around us, to hold us tight, and to un help us to understand everything that's going on and help us to lift up once more again. So when we pour libation, we're, just, we're going to think of someone who has passed on, who is a positive influence in our lives. We're going to think of that person who has passed on, who has put us on the, on the side of right. You know, it might have been an old grandmother who told you, baby, you need to go this way. Or it might be a story that you've read about Sojourner Truth or one of those uh, unsung heroes ancestors that many of us don't even know their names. But maybe you know because maybe you've been studying. So I'm going to start it off and I'm going to call out a couple of names and then afterwards when we say Ashe. And Ashe is just, let it be so. And we want to make sure that you guys understand that, because some people might tell you, oh, that's, that's wrong. You're, you're worshiping your ancestors. No, we're honoring our ancestors and who they were and how they lived their life and their time that they had on this planet. And we give thanks for them, because if it were not for them, would we be standing here right now today? I don't think so. So right now, we want to call for the ancestors from the north, the south, the east, the west. Those ancestors that have given us strength. Those ancestors that have allowed us to be able to be here today. Those ancestors that have come across the waters and have made it and have helped us to have strong blood strong, powerful minds. We thank you and we call upon your names. The first name I would like to call, I would like to pour libation to Robert Nesta Marley, who is a big inspiration in my life and how he lived his life with what the Most High had given him. I would like to pour libation to my grandfather, who has given me the strength to be who I am today by just knowing what kind of a man he was. And I would like to open it up and just call out their names. Call out their names. Olive Clark. Ashe. Will Stanford. Ashe. Joseph Ashe. Ashe. Louis Weaver. Ashe. Charlotte Sullivan. Ashe. Alonzo Davis. Ashe. Claude Epperson. Ashe. Rosalind Randolph. Ashe. William Lloyd Bland. Ashe. Ashe. Willie Bradlock. Ashe. George and Jonathan Jackson. Ashe. Ashe. Lucille Bennett. Ashe. Ashe. Part of the Anderson. Ashe. Mozilla Jones. Ashe. Debbie. 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 Paul Robinson. Ashe. Coach Dupree. Ashe. Emma and Bias Waters. Ashe. Ashe. John Henry Clark. Ashe. Thank you, Ashe. 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 All the Trayvon Martins. Ashe. 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 And our ancestors at the bottom of the land. Yes. Ashe. Our prisoners that are off incarcerated throughout this country. Ashe. Tucson the open Ashe. Dr. Amos Wilson. Yes. Ashe. Asa Dillard. Ashe. 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 Ashe.
but here's how I would do it. Each one of these is about 12, maybe 15 minutes in length. I would show that chapter, and then I'd stop. Mm. And I do what's called a word splash. I do it with children. A word splash is when children just write down words, words that come to mind. And you have a circle in the middle, you have a, a central theme in the middle, and then you start to draw arrows from that, and you start to jot down people's words. And then the next step is you say to people, okay, when that word came up, what, what were you thinking about? Let's, let's give me more. So you, you start from the word. Because the mind thinks in visuals. And they attach words to visuals. And then they attach concepts and explanation of the word that describes the visual. So you start with the word splash, and then you say, give me more. So if somebody says, um, Africa, you write Africa, and then you say, give me more. What, what, when you said Africa, what do you mean? And then they tell you, well, I was talking about the geographic location. I was talking about things that happened in Africa that we don't know about. I say, okay. And then I go around the room and I ask other people, anybody have anything else to add to what they said? They say, well, I was thinking about the fact that it's the richest nation on earth. And they would go, because what, what am I doing now? I'm inducing. I'm drawing them out. I'm drawing their knowledge out. And this is what they're doing in the classroom. And I would do it, maybe every section here would last maybe a half hour. Maybe if it's 12 minutes in length, and then the word splash, and then the give me more part of it may, may last uh, 20 minutes or so, or whatever. Uh, so I'm talking about a long, protracted study session. Because if that's true, you may only be able to get through maybe two or three at a time. So then the next session, you might do another two or three, which would be the origins of life in Africa. And you'd go to Hidden Colors 1, Chapter 2, and then you'd go to Hidden Colors 2, Chapter 3, the global African presence. Now, for those of you who are videographers and who have the potential to do this, let me recommend that you might want to take Hidden Colors 1 and 2 and put it in this order. Yes, sir. Edit it into this order. Oh. Mm. You see, and then have your sessions along that. So your first segment might be the four that I just gave you. The second segment might be, so now what you're doing is that you're taking hidden colors one and two and you're, you're, you're shuffling it like you do cards, where they apply. This is how the human mind works, going back to the brain. Okay, now, I could go through this, but it would take time, don't want to spend the time doing that. However, email me, I have my cards here, email me and I will send this back to you. Okay, okay so just in the information box, just put Sacramento, Hidden, color, uh, hidden Colors Guide, and I'll send it back to you. Okay, so that'll save you a lot of time from me having to go through this because there's so much I want to talk to you about today. And, and I really don't want to get too deep into this. But I also want to return back because when Brother, I mean, I didn't realize that Brother was going to drop this, but that, that piece on, on the drumming was very important to me because it, it demonstrated so much. Uh, you have children in the classroom. and they're learning. You have basically three parts to your brain. You have a brain stem, you have the limbic system, and you have the neocortex. Every one of those parts of the brain have a specific function to do. The brain stem is called your reptilian brain. Mm. That's the early brain. That's the fight or flight brain. Mm. That's the one that has been born to protect the organism. Its job is to protect. Okay, something go down, yeah, I'm either going to run or we're going to fight. Mm -hmm. okay. Born up out of the brain stem is going to come the limbic system. The limbic system is responsible for your emotional growth. Mm -hmm. Out of the limbic system, out of the, the brain stem, out of the limbic system is going to be born the neocortex. That is where you think. That's that big part of the brain, okay? Now, 
through the growth, if we want to call it the evolution of the human entity as, as we know us. Different things happen to the brain. And in the limbic system, what happened was our early peoples, you have six forms of the human family. Orsolopithecus robustus, Orsolopithecus gracile, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens sapiens. Those are six forms of human being. Mm. What is going to happen in the brain is that the brain, have you ever been thinking so hard that you literally have a headache? Yeah. Well, actually, your, your, your brain acts like a muscle. So really, when you're thinking, your, your brain is throbbing. Okay, And what's happening is that your brain, in its throbbing, is like a muscle that's growing. But at the same time, what's happening is turning inward and it's creating the, the nooks and the crannies of the brain. Okay, But at the same time, it's beginning to push out. It's push out. And in, in the prefrontal part of your brain, what was at one time in the early human family a slanted forehead is now going to push that slanted forehead out to become what we now call a forehead. Okay, when that happens, in your brain, your limbic system, your pineal gland is going to drop into your limbic system. And it's going to rest in an area that we call the ventricular system, the third ventricle in particular. See, this is why we have to have brain anatomy classes. We have to understand this. Fundamentally, when you understand what I'm explaining to you, you can call into being whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And that's what our ancestors were searching for. They were searching for the ability to become one with nature at one's will. Mm -hmm. that's, what the, that's what made them so great, is that, you see, evolution is when we moved out and our body began to evolve. But once your lungs were the right size, your brain was the right size, your arms were the right size, your heart was the right size, everything was perfect in the human body, you no longer evolved, you began to involve. And that involution was the search for the God within. Because that's our purpose. It, 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 don't every holy book say mm -hmm. that God created creation but could not know him herself so therefore created creations in order to reflect back on them to know that they were God well that's who we are our job is to know that we are God so after the body got right we have to start to go inward and we start to involve because of the function of the brain so when the ventricular system sat down you have four ventricles you have two lateral ventricles and uh, you have um, the two lateral ventricles that join, because I have it all on my computer, but time would take up too much time for me to go from place to place. So if you just follow my words, uh, and when I do get a chance to really get deep inside, we'll take this step by step, and you'll be able to see it for what it really is, because I've got numbers of, of PowerPoint pictures of the brain, the functioning of the brain, and a number of different things. Maybe this afternoon, if I could get back into it, when I see how my time is going, I'll, you know, I'll be able to do it, but I don't want to over overwhelm us uh, by attempting to do this. Uh, but when that happened, it allowed the ventricular system, which are like little balloons, to open up. When this came out, it sat the ventricular system down and it allowed the, the ventricles to open up. Inside, your la inside of your ventricles, you have a place, you, you have bundles of tissues that are known as the choroid plexus. C-H-O-R-O-I-D-P-L-E-X-U-S. These little bundles is what creates cerebrospinal fluid. And that's what bathes your central nervous system from head top to shoe stop. Throughout your entire nervous system. Okay? Your, your cerebrospinal fluid has 13 times the amount of melanin than your blood system. Deeply melanated, crystallized liquids. The very nature of what the cosmic universe is made up of is your cerebral spinal fluid. And it bathes your 12 pigmented sections in your brain stem, which includes the locus coeruleus and the substantia nigra. We got the black substance in us, but nobody ever says it's black. Substantia nigra? <laughs> locus coeruleus? 
Corellius means black in Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. Locus means dot or point. Black dot. So we have it in us, but no one's putting it together for us for us to be able to understand and really key into what this is. When the ventricular system was allowed to come down and stop and open up, it began to spread this cerebrospinal fluid throughout the body which allowed the brain to function, allowed the brain to begin to go to its higher levels of consciousness. And because of where it was located, it literally put into motion a conscious movement of your chakra systems, which is your spiritual wheels of melanin. You know the song by Friends of Distinction, Going in Circles? Mm -hmm. It's more than what you think. Go back and listen to that song. Mm -hmm. And so the brain functions in a certain way that when the brain opened up, it was able to take in information on levels, and that's what brought us. Now, the pyramid builders and the, the Africans that were in the classical African period, the early dynasties, was called the old dynasty. They had risen to a level of consciousness that Dr. Richard King, brilliant doctor, psychiatrist, melanist from Los Angeles, yeah. he calls this new group of human beings homo perfectus. Mm -hmm. We were on our seventh level of knowledge and wisdom before the Yoruba came amongst us. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they started, we weren't evolving, we weren't involving, we started to devolve. Mm -hmm. And now our job is to take this information and begin to look at how we can begin to develop. You see all of these different lesson plans that I have here, okay? Just going to end with this because I know that we have to move uh, to... There's evidence of an African woman in San Diego that dates back 17,000 years. There's evidence of Africans in Peru, in Tierra del Fuego, the southernmost tip of America. You want to know what they look like? I'm going to show you what the original people of America look like. That's what the original indigenous people look like. And that's what made the Algonquin, the Inuit, and the Asian. That's why they were called the Red Man. That was their blood. The first two migrations, first three migrations to this part of the world, pure African people. Thousands of years ago. So I have blood from Cherokee, Choctaw, Haudenosaunee or Iroquois, Onondaga, Pequot. I have all that blood through my vein. But you know, I got a problem with them. Mm. I got a problem with how they treated our people in Cherokee. Mm. Yes, sir. I have a problem with them. Yes, sir. And until you get with the great spirit, I ain't getting with you. Mm. And I don't know if they care about what I'm saying. I don't know if they like what I'm saying. But when you deny the, na the nature of who you are, you're as bad as a Yoruba, mm. as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Okay. And so Cherokee better check themselves before they wreck themselves. Because okay. they're not in line with the great spirit. Yes, sir. The Choctaw, Seminole. Seminole were black. Mm -hmm. I'm in California. The Khalifa were black. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very curly hair, very wide nose, very thick lip, beautiful, handsome people that were then overtaken by a lighter complexion, yellowish, beigeous complexion people. And do you know how you, you know that these people were Africans is because, see, we get caught up in complexion. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois said that was going to be the problem of the 20th century was complexion. But that's not how you know someone's an African. Mm. It's by your prognostic jaw. That's how you know someone's black. They have a machine called the craniometric machine that they put a skull in. And what they'll do is that they, in, in, in putting this uh, skull into uh, this machine, they can measure the angle of the face and the jaw. And if your jaw is somewhere between 61 degrees and basically 82 degrees, you have what's called a prognostic jaw. It juts out. In other words, the, the bridge of your nose and your jaw are parallel to each other. 
If you are somewhere between 83 and 90, you're called orthognathic. And that makes it that your jaw starts to jut in, okay? And that is what Eurasians' faces look like for the most part. It's almost like it's a pyramid. It comes down and then your face goes in. If you're 91 degrees beyond in the craniometric machine, you are called a hypernathic jaw. So then when we're judging who we are as a people, we're too caught up on complexion. We need to start looking at the jaw to, dis to understand who is African because a prognostic jaw comes out of heat. An orthognathic jaw comes out of cold. Mm. So that as we were depigmenting ourselves, our, our morphology, our facial structure changed and our physiology changed too. Phenotype changed. And that's how we have to start to judge each other. And we, we have to begin. This is what the original. This individual has more in common with uh, the Khoisan of Southern Africa than they do with any Cherokee, any Native American that's in America today. That is the original American. Short stature, well melanated, very curly hair. And by the way, she is a sister. That's a reconstructed face of what she looked like. And they know it. They know. We don't know. But guess what? Now we do. Listen, we're going to wrap this segment up. Vendors are out here. Let me end, the brother, because I didn't answer your question. Medumneta, which means uh, divine writing or sacred script. was not, is not, I don't believe, a spoken language. Mm -hmm. It's a pictographic language. Just like when you go uh, to an international airport uh, and you see a picture of a man, or you see a picture of a woman, you know that a man goes in that room, and that's a men's room. It doesn't say hombre, it doesn't say loan. It just has a picture, it's pictograph, but it speaks to you, it's right. symbolic. Meduneta is not a spoken language. It is a symbolic language that is to bring to you a collective amount of information almost immediately upon looking at that particular visual. There's a reason why our ancestors carved on the walls because those pictographs that you're looking at literally can come out at you if you're a six-dimensional thinker. And they can tell you multiple things, not just what you're looking at, See, when you're linear, when you are a three-dimensional thinker, what you're looking at is what you get. However, when you're six-dimensional, not only does the picture come out at you, but you go into the picture. And therefore, it starts to revolve and involve an entire story that you could be looking at a picture on the wall, and that could be biology 101 and 102 combined. One pictograph can be an entire encyclopedic piece of information. Okay. In my attempt to explain this concept, in my development of my totem, we each have a totem. We all belong to an African, we all belong to an African animal world. There is an animal that reflects us. And sometimes they're combined. If you look at the natures, you'll see there's a head of a human and the body of a ram. Head of a human, body of a snake. Head of a human, body of a uh, 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 head of a human body of a dung beetle. You, you can see it juxtapose all sorts of things. When it's the body of the animal, it's telling you to live like the animal. When, it's, when the head is the animal, it tells you to think like the animal. You see? And then whatever crown they have on top of their head is telling you who it is. So if you see a throne, you always know it's going to be a set. Okay? If you see the ram horns, you always know that it's a moon. You know, if you see the disc with the sun in the middle, it's always head Peru. In the present world that we're living in today, I began to attempt to find a way to take what I perceive to be my totem, my animal world, and to put it into a metunetic concept that I could explain. And I said, there's no better way to do it than to put it on a t-shirt and a head kerchief. The panther, the body of a panther, but the tail of the panther is a cobra. 
both feminine principles. Okay? Bastet, the panther. Bast, the black cat. That's why they always tell you black cat's bad luck. Because if you ever knew the good luck, you'd, they'd be in trouble. So they make you avoid by, by giving you some type of superstition on it. You see, number 13, bad number, greatest number in the world. <laughs> but if you fear it, you ain't never going to want it. Okay? I look for things that are 13. Hmm. Bastet is the body that takes us through this planet. Bastet is a form of, you know they say cats have nine lives. So on an earthly level, Bastet represents the ability to resurrect yourself. Hmm. You can come up out of death and have another life. Mm. She is the sister to Heru in the story. Heru is the, the falcon, um, the, the Heruan factor that resurrects himself and continues the life of his father, Asar. But another story told in Kemet is that his sister Bastet is the black cat. And so ba Bastet is the feminine form of the male form of Heru. One one ko for drummers. Ashe. Ashe. The snake. Gil Scott Heron has a whole piece when he does the bottle live, where he talks about the one one ko beat that runs through the world. It's in salsa music, it's in Haitian Creole music, it's in high life of Ghana. It's even amongst us when we hear it. Basically, you're you know you're dealing with the sound. It runs through the whole, that is one one ko. That's the beat, that's the life, that's the vibration of the snake. The snake does something very special in his, her life. And that is that they are able to shed their skin. And so in shedding their skin, it is equivalent to coming forward to a new life. And so when they're ready to come forward to the new life after they've been in hibernation, they go to a very rough, rocky area and they begin to slither across it and it opens up the dead skin. As it opens up the dead skin, they come forward with the new skin, leaving the old skin behind. So my conceptual framework, going back to the brain, going back to Legans, going back to unifying, my name is Kaba Hiawatha Kamene. Ka, spirit, Ba is soul. Hiawatha is the indigenous brother that unified the five nations of the French called them the Iroquois, but they called themselves the Haudenosaunee. And he united them 500 years before Yurugu ever came. Mm. He said, because one day, he was called, known as the dreamer, he said, one day you're gonna have a bigger foe to deal with. You better stop fighting amongst yourselves. Unite yourselves. So he took the Cayuga, the Mohawk, the Seneca, the Oneida, and the Onondaga, and united them as a people. And they would do war no more. He picked up a bush and had them put their hatchets in it. And he dropped the bush over the hatchets. You, 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 you ever heard the term to bury the hatchet? Yeah. That's where that comes from. Okay. Hiawatha, the uniter. And then Ka Mene. Ka is spirit of Mene, the first pharaoh of the first dynasty that unifies Shema Tawi, the upper and lower land. When I was correcting my name from Booker T. Coleman Jr., the shamans and those that guided me through the process told me, do not pick a name that describes who you are. Choose a name that determines what your divine destiny is on the planet. Do not have a name that is a noun.